morning. I'm trying to record a podcast. Hey, everybody. It's Angela Ardolino with Your Natural Dog. And I am thrilled about my guest today. It's Dr. Connor Brady. He's the author of Feeding Dogs and has, this is a book that every pet parent should have and every pet parent should have it share with their veterinarian if they are not a believer in real feeding your dog real or fresh food. But my favorite thing about my guest today is that he reminds me of myself where he learned what animals, dogs specifically needed nutritionally and, you know, has a doctorate in studying the effects of nutrition on the behavior and gut um, morphology of mammals, yet nobody believed him. So he literally got involved and, and did his own research and proved that he worked, he was a guide dog trainer and switched the dogs over to a raw, fresh diet and watched, it was a nonprofit organization and watched their vet bills go down 80% when we were supporting our dog's immune system and gut microbiome by feeding them a real diet of real food, free of preservatives and carbohydrates. So, you know, a lot of people are, you know, worried about feeding their pets raw or fresh because they think it's going to be more expensive when they don't realize it's going to save them so much money, you know, when that dog gets to be two, three, four, and then into his senior years, you're going to have much less issues, much, much less disease. So it's an awesome conversation where we talk about um, not only the pet food industry, why our, what we have to buy our dogs in a grocery store is just not good for them, and what we can do to help our dogs uh, transition, why it's so important. So join me today. It's going to be so fun. Dr. Connor Brady today. This is Blanche, and she's the most noodle dog you've ever met in your entire life. She's just the most loved dog you've ever met, but if you leave her alone, it becomes a total opposite thing. Blanche has severe separation anxiety to the point where she will scratch doors down to the wood, bark all night, cry if you leave her for five minutes. Um, I tried the collars, I tried the sprays, I tried thunder blankets. The only thing that's ever worked was CBD, and that's why I got started in this business. Our comp tincture is 550 milligrams of full spectrum CBD and lavender. It's the perfect remedy for separation anxiety, anxiety, stress, or fear. I love my dog, and I hated knowing that she was home freaking out. So I wanted to find an all natural way to do it. No doggy Prozac, all natural. And once I found CBD, there's no other option. CBD dog health, healing naturally. Hey, everybody, we're back with Angela Ardolino and your natural dog and my guest, Dr. Connor Brady. Thank you so much for being here today. I am freaking thrilled to have you <laughs> on the show today. Um, oh, and I want to tell you why. Um, we've already I've already told my audience all about you, so you don't have to repeat who you are and where you came from, because I already oh. told them already. But okay. what I love is that you're such an inspiration to me because... I feel like I am you 10 years ago okay. and where I start where, you know, back in 2016, I got into cannabis, studied it, learned all about it, started to apply it. And then nobody believes you and everybody wants yeah. research, but nobody's doing the research. And you yeah. went out and did your own research. Yeah. Yeah. And you proved way, what you learned. Yeah. And, but it's 10 years later and now you have a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is so, horrible when you're trying to uh, when you're trying to tell them the so truth. Explain you that know? because I I feel uh, kismet with you because I feel like um, you're like okay I've proved it now I know how do I get that out that message out how do I um, get it into the hands of veterinarians because as we know veterinarians aren't taught about nutrition and diet yes. and yeah. that's where most pet parents turn to to get that information and. They're recommending a science diet, which is yes, not indeed. based yeah. on science at all. Help no. our listeners kind of understand that a little bit. Uh, look, it's actually very topical what you're asking there because, you know, I, I started writing it 10 years ago. I, had, I quit my job in guide dogs. They, they wouldn't see the light. You know, we had, we had just seen a, a rival guide dog organization change 200 dogs from dry to raw. 
and I'm reading this report and it's like 80% drop in veterinary bills for a charity. 80% drop 80%. in vet bills. I'll and, send you the news clip to share with your listeners later. And yeah. that's what listeners don't understand is that, mm. you know, they go, well, I don't understand. My dog seems fine. Your dog's not fine. If your dog mm. is itching and has yeah. ear infections and yeah. uh, poop isn't well, your dog isn't okay. Yeah, yeah. This was for recurring skin, ear and gut conditions, orthopedic surgery and consult. But it's the top... 80 90 percent of your veterinary bill if you're if you're a training organization but they also branded their own food look it was just such a huge obvious thing for me i was already kind of lecturing on it and that was supposed to be my role and i take it back to my superiors they don't believe me and the vets particularly so i got in a big huff and i just said look guys you're supposed to be scientists you know so just don't tell me i'm lying you know look at what they're doing and 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 try it and just see what happens you know let's take our dogs on steroids seven out of 18 of the dogs i was working with were on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories just casual use imagine that in a schoolroom, as if like it's normal for kids to be on these drugs so you know, they wouldn't listen to me. Anyway, 10 years later, I get the book out. I go back to research and long, lonely nights in my room till four o'clock in the morning kind of thing. I love it, but, you know, it is a, it's a it's a tough old process doing that sort of work. I get the book out. And just as you just said there, um, they, they first of all spend those 10 years saying, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? Where's the science? And so we have to prove... <clears throat> excuse me, we have to prove what they've done is wrong. So they've leapt to this very strange position, feeding this ridiculous product made by candy companies. And then I have to prove what they're doing is wrong for it to make sense to them. But it's not, that's not really the goal. Really, it should have been, you know, you should have leapt there on the back of some good science. What studies did you read that convinced you ultra high carbohydrate diets was good for a meat eater? Anyway, I sh the problem is the book is now written, but are they reading it? No. So we have we have a bit of an issue here where we are with various kind of ideas where we're getting that book into hands of young veterinary students and getting some uh, plans in place that they can pick it up and all that. So you can spend your time beating your head against the veterinary wall. But I do firmly believe that all revolutions come from the ground up. So as uh, as Morrison said, they've got the guns, but we've got the numbers. So when people just start seeing the truth and buying raw 20 percent of the uk market now is feeding raw dog food suddenly vets are now becoming inundated with people saying you know don't call me crazy for this diet i want to work with you vet but if you continue on treating me like a fool i'm not going to sponsor you anymore i'm not going to spend money with you and you vote with your feet and you go to the vet that does support you and suddenly the vets are forced to pay attention and spend two hours you know 15 minutes and they would have some of the answers they needed but um so i think it's kind of it, it, it will the, the change will be kind of forced upon them and then hopefully my book too <laughs> yeah well i i think um I, I mean i'm so happy that you did it and the reason that your book is so important is because it does take 10 years yeah you know yeah. Uh, if someone told you that 10 years ago you would have been like screw that but yeah. it does take and now no one can deny it and we're yeah. going to take our, your book and make sure it gets in everybody's hands and that everybody that. reads it because it's true. And what the yeah. what the industry will do is be forced to change and figure out a new way to manipulate us and lie to us. Indeed. But I think what's crazy is um, when I got in, especially when I started this podcast, I didn't think I'd be talking so much about food. But food and the pharmaceutical industry are both doing the same things to us. And they're making 100%. us dependent on them and they're feeding into each other. And, you know, these big uh, Mars and uh, Colgate that own these big companies now in the United States own the hospital. They yeah. own the drug. They own yeah. the insurance plan. They own yeah. every poison mm. thing that happens to your dog. So they make it so easy and convenient and cheap for you to buy the toxins that you put on your dog and to feed yeah. your dog. And then here's, I don't know if you know this about me, I've got two uh, brick and mortar shops. So yeah. we only sell the good food and are constantly saying to the person, you know, just incorporate real food. Yeah. But I think yeah. the easiest way for us to do it is if what's funny is that even those of us who know that we're in charge of our own health and our family's health and our pet's health still don't make the correlation of what works for us as human beings also works yeah. for our pets. Yeah, I think I think fear really is the biggest motivator. This industry is only going one way. I think dry food sales for the first time ever fell in volume in 2013. And since then, it's slipping down. And natural pet food is 50% of the US market. Grain free is dominating. So you can see a couple of little attacks. And I'm going to freeze and... you there for a minute. I want the audience to understand that when that happens, 
means they go even harder. So exactly. that's when you go into your grocery store and you're going to start seeing things like, um, oh shit, what the hell's the one? Fresh pet, mm -hmm. which is yeah. so far from being fresh oh, and real over food. Here now. That's over but here now. they understand the trend is is that people are getting away from kibble and they're going yeah. this way. So now they need to make a new shitty food for you to yeah. buy because exactly. they know that that's the way the trend is going. So you have to yeah. educate yourself. And this book is the easiest way to do it. And if you just want to skip to the last chapter to figure out what to do, because he's going to tell you all the research, why it's done the certain way. I feel like copying your model for a cannabis book. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> they want to see, like, there is a lot of nutrition books out there, and there's been a lot of recipe books. But, like, uh, I was really gearing it towards the raw nerds, towards Angela and the people listening to this podcast, people that want the info. And so that's not all the market. A lot of the market just want the right answer. And, right. Uh, there, like I said, there's a lot of fear. So fear keeps people selecting the product. They think that if they don't feel the dog you know, the right amount of manganese, his butt will fall off or something. And it's like, you know, you can do it. This is just the fear that they induce into the market via the veterinary industry, which they own, as you said. Uh, Mars has 50,000 vets on the books. Can you believe that? They own, in the US, they own Antec, Banfield, they own all the diagnostics, huge amounts of hospitals. Have you ever been into a, a vet school here in the United States? No, well, it's the exact same plan. Walls over here. are walk, lined with all their posters. That yeah. All the students get free food or very discounted shop. food. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Brainwashing. So like the, the, yeah, the fear fear is a great one because they can't talk about nutrition. So they can't enter a nutritional conversation. They used to be able to say things like, well, carbs are an excellent source of energy. And I'll go, well, so are Mars bars and Coca-Cola. What's the point? You know, it's, is it suitable long term in the face of this obesity and cancer crisis and pancreatitis and all the other things that are linked to high carb diets? So they can't talk about those things. So they talk about fear, fear of hazardous microbiology. Everyone's terrified of microbiology. Oh, a lot of fear there. And um, getting a bit topical there. But it is a great motivator to get you to buy stuff. And so fear, fear, fear keeps you and the vet reaching for that picture of your dog. And you feed this on Tuesdays if he turns left more than right. And people thinking that a Labrador is completely different to a retriever. You know, it's just such and, nonsense. And but their it's, doctor it's, it's and their vet is telling them that. Yeah, that's it. So they believe to, it. To disagree with a vet. And it's hard. Even when you do learn the information, it's very hard for people to stand there in front of a vet who has, you know, oodles of uh, more kind of science behind them. They're wearing a white jacket after all. It's hard for you to stand there and go, no, you're wrong. I'm right. It's very difficult. It's it's, uh, it's hard with a GP. You know, it's it's hard to say these things, uh, when, even though you know you're right, because you can be easily um pulled aside by some scientific statement that they make. And you go, yeah, well, that's just not what I'm seeing, you know, so... It, it takes a while, but that's why I think spending time thinking about and stressing about and arguing with a vet um, it isn't good, particularly if you're bringing science because their position isn't based in science. So you bringing science is not going to make a damn bit of difference to them because they're going to be trusting the science in inverted commas. And as soon as you make a valid point, it's swerve off to the, oh, how do you know you'll get the balance right? You make a point there, swerve off to, oh, isn't raw dangerous? And you go, you're just fighting people in the dark. It's just ridiculous. So generally, you'll find a vet that, that works with you. They're, they are growing in numbers and you just find the vet that supports you. Zoom. The one good thing that's come out of this pandemic is that there's a lot of natural vets on Zoom and you can chat to them for 10 or 15 minutes. Can people minutes, do consults them. with you? Yeah, that people do consults with us awesome. all the time. Yeah, and we're taking on two new people now in January. and uh, We're doing that the is, same thing. Yeah, it's so good, um, but it, it can be um, it can be quite difficult sometimes because when people come to RAW, 50% of the new clients to RAW are people with health conditions. And those people have probably been through two or three vets, a lot of conventional meds, a lot of different foods. Their guts can be in bits. Yeah. So you get these really troubling cases and it's like, bloody hell, it's hard work. You know, it can be quite relenting, but, but uh, relentless, but you get a lot of them right. And it's, right, because you have to reward. almost detox the dog That's it. from yeah. everything and, and then and start the client. fresh scrub out their brain you know and it's right. kind of like everything you've heard is uh, anything in a packet we need to avoid for a while and let's just get very simple with this dog and find out what the problem is it's very easy advice really when when you get into it but people do need to be um, brought back from the edge of this kind of product driven focus on the symptoms repress the symptoms keep turning off the smoke alarms until you are desperately ill until you have no system anymore yeah, to help exactly yeah so, so focusing on the cause tell our audience why are there so many carbs in that bag of dog food? Um, we know why they're not good. Uh, yeah. Carbohydrates turn into sugar. Sugar yeah. is awful, causes inflammation, feeds cancer. Um, yeah. And so we don't want, why is our dog food filled with carbohydrates? 
Well, I think everybody knows the answer to that deep down. And the answer is purely uh, is money. It's profit. It increases cheap. the value. Yeah, cheap, cheap, cheap. Cereal, particularly the cereal used in pet food, which you don't even have to transport correctly. I love that you call it trucks. cereal. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it, that's how we tell people. I'm like, um, a shitty bag of kibble is like us eating Captain Crunch every single day yeah. with no milk. And yeah, maybe a good it. one is eating Cheerios, which, yeah. you know, is filled with glyphosate. So I don't even know if that's a good example. Yeah. Well, like it's the Cheerios. I'm like, I, I can't, I'm never going to name brands, but I'll happily let you do it. But the, All uh, day long, when, I will. <laughs> yeah, I ain't scared. Stuff. <laughs> okay, I am slightly. But um, so like, if you look at a multicolored cereal, you know, this thing looks almost like a pea. And it's like, if you want to give your dog a pea, give him a pea. Why right? are you feeding food like objects? This is shaped like a bone, but crucially, it's not a bone. It's as hard <laughs> as a bone. It's flavored like a bone. Uh, and it's supposed to do the same thing. Only bones are free and nutritious and you can't have them. So we should feed these. Oh, you could go on. So yeah, look, the carbohydrate thing is purely a, a money making thing. And um it's it's the best foods dry foods realize this and they they don't they no longer spin much guff about it they say it might be important for energy sled dogs perform better without uh, carbohydrates so there goes that myth and uh, so working dogs do better the more protein you feed them because they're protein and fat eaters so generally uh, the dry food companies are trying to swerve now and well we don't use wheat and corn like the worst of carbs you could possibly use we use uh, sweet potato and peas it's still We're a grain huge free. amount of, right. yeah it's still a huge amount of carbohydrates though so it doesn't really matter to your gut as long as that has been processed and ready to go that just turns to sugar and insulin which is the problem instantly so it, the grain free is one tiny step forward to get away from wheat and corn and stuff but my god it's not a huge step you're on the you're on the ladder but not much of one um so yeah i think co companies are trying to include more meat in their dry foods now but the problem is it's ultra processed meat denaturing me so you could move to these meaty dry foods is that a good idea that we eat huge amounts of cooked meat that's been ultra processed in extrusion cooking so we don't know so yes they they work as a stopgap to lead people up the path and go look maybe you can add in some real bits to the bowl or you know you can move to more meaty or dry food but ultimately when you start teaching them you would save more money feeding real sh meat off the shelf of the supermarket than you would that pet food and your vet will have the benefit of not going to the vet so often so um y yeah i think they'll work as a stopgap these meatier products as they move away from carbs but um yeah, the the nonsense behind carbohydrates is unbelievable. In fact, the science behind it is is psychopathic. Like when you go to this huge book, the Small Animal Clinical Nutrition, which the vets use implicitly in college as their kind of cornerstone, written by Colgate Palmolive, who own Hills Pet Food, which doesn't seem to deter any vets from reading it. So you know, it's one view. It's not, it's important to understand what they say, but. And then you go to the section on canine carbohydrate requirements and there's a paragraph on it. This is a 1300 page manual, thousands of references. And on the biggest ingredient this animal eats, 60% of his diet for life, they afforded a paragraph and they used three or four studies from 50 years ago. And it's just this may be useful, carbs may be useful. It's like, so you have zero long uh, long studies of, of, of how suitable this might be for the dog and that's that was really one of the first things that I looked at I said oh I thought I was going to find lots of really I thought it was going to be hard to tease apart the wheat from the chaff but actually there's just no science there so your vet won't actually present you with a study that supports the stance it's just I, well the science is done and you, know? you know what if you to me I'm all I'm a I'm a type of person and I know lots of holistic vets that are this way if I have been using and doing something for the past six years and watched and I haven't been to a vet in six years because I haven't had any issues um, because I'm supporting my dog's gut health and immune system and not putting toxins in them, yeah. um, there's nothing that you can say to me that's yeah. going to tell me otherwise. I don't care what your science says. I'm here. Yeah. I have a rescue farm. I have... 13 dogs, this many chickens, geese, pigs, all of them are eating real food, not yeah. being pharmaceuticals. Nobody has a weird rash. Nobody's pooping blood. No yeah. But guess what? That's not how my life was, you know, 15 yeah. years ago with my first dog when I did everything my conventional vet yeah. did. Yeah, I exactly. also think that there's this, that I, I can't get it. Like it's the information's out there now. So there's no denying it. And um, I don't know. I think there's also this this thing with conventional vets that have been practicing for a long time that don't want to admit what they were doing was not right yeah. or that something could be better, which drives yeah. me crazy. Um, yeah. So 
us pet the, parents the, really need to keep that in mind. I have to take a short break, but when we come okay. back, I'd love to start talking about, and I know I, I've already heard you talk about these items, about how ridiculous it is of what, when our dog is sick, what the vet is telling them to, to do. You know, if it's cancer or pancreatitis or diabetes or what, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so when we come back, we'll talk about that. We'll be right back. Okay. This is Daisy. She's our 17-year-old rescue, and her owner surrendered her to the veterinarian because she couldn't walk anymore. And the vet gave us a call, and we rescued her, brought her to our rescue farm here. We took her off all of her uh, prescription medications. She was having seizures every day, grand mal seizures. She had no hair on her feet, on her tail. And we have her on a CBD regimen, and she has come back to life. She's become puppy-like. She runs around and plays, and she could live to be 20 years old and live a very long, happy, pain-free life. CBD Dog Health, healing naturally. All right, we are back with Dr. Connor Brady, the author of what I think is the must-have book for pet parents who are really into this. From now on, if you ask me how to feed your dog, I'm just going to tell you to read this book or at least skip to the last chapter and read that <laughs> yeah. chapter. Um, because I even know that um, like uh, the feeding uh, Forever Dog book just came yeah. out and everybody yeah. was hoping it would just be really easy telling them exactly what to do. And it's funny because I took the book and I went to all my holistic vets and I said, everybody in the United States is going to be looking for vets who are going to be implementing this. And yeah, there aren't any. You're it. Yeah. You guys are yeah. it. Yeah. So um, they're going to be knocking down your doors. They're going to be. I'm trying to help holistic vets get on telemedicine to yeah. talk to these people. Yeah. Um, we do consults with our chief vet, Dr. Zach, and uh, Dr. we have a board of advisors, also Dr. Sarah Urban. And we spend, probably like you do, the entire time giving it a second opinion or asking why did they prescribe that? Yeah, yeah. And that pet parent doesn't know. Just like our health, you have to take control of it. You have to take control of your pet's health. Your vet doesn't know everything. Your vet is supposed to be working with you. When I'm in my store and someone comes in and their dog has all kinds of issues, pancreatitis I hear all the time. And this is yeah. what always kills me is that they say, my vet says they have to have a low protein diet so they can't mm. eat raw. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's criminal. That when we have so much evidence to the contrary now, one of the stronger health issues It doesn't even make sense. About. Common sense. Yeah. It doesn't even make, yeah. let's use common sense. Don't trust what they're saying. They weren't trained in this. They're not nutritionists. Yeah. You yeah. are. Yeah. Very you hard are. for very hard for a pet owner though to say something like that like when you're particularly with pancreatitis it's supposed to be like a gunshot uh, in the guts it's, it's agony and uh, two-thirds of healthy cats and dogs on the table when they're being uh, put to sleep they uh, are suffering some form of pancreatitis like it's normal that the pancreas is just rotting away like this mm -hmm. so we now know thanks to lots of studies from 2014 up to 2017 that while the vet might say, did you give him a bit of sausage? Did you give him the fat off your steak? And blame, turn the blame on you. Just like obesity is your problem. You've, you've been overfeeding him. Have you been loving him too much? You know, so you've just been feeding too much of this high octane fat inducing compound. So uh, with pancreatitis, we now know that uh, you, the pancreas should have been able for a little bit of sausage or fat off a steak. This animal loves to eat fat. Of course it does. The problem has been high carbohydrate diets. We now know from studies of humans and now dogs, thanks to Mark Roberts and a few others, that the more carbohydrates you feed, the more the body goes, oh, happily, I'll happily burn carbohydrates. They're a nice fast energy. So they, the body burns carbohydrates and it takes its eye off burning fat. So rather paradoxically, fat increases in the blood. The vet has a look at the animal, sees fat building in the blood and goes, stop feeding fat, feed more carbohydrates. And boom, you've got your, you've got your acute pancreatitis episode. And then the dog never recovers because the vet always keeps them on high carbohydrate diets. So we've sent this around to numerous veterinary organizations now. High carbohydrate diets for dogs with pancreatitis is a sin. We now know this. These, the studies are here. Why isn't this being disseminated through veterinary colleges? This is going to save a huge amount of dogs a lot of pain. And it's the same with cancer. Cancer needs carbohydrates. It needs insulin to grow. That's how we find cancer in the body. We make somebody drink a radioactive cola. And then you track where the cola goes and the tumors light up like Christmas trees. It's called a PET scan. 
But this is what tumours do. Sugar spikes insulin and insulin is a growth hormone. And so that's what the tumour wants. So it has all these receptors around it. So we know from studies of dogs that the less carbohydrates you feed them, the less the cancer grows. So we know you've got to get rid of the carbohydrates. Sugar and carbs gone in a cancer patient. You know, instantly, particularly in an animal with no metabolic needed carbohydrates. That's the second thing we've been attacking the, the veterinary industries. They don't even respond to the email. We'll give you the free lecture. We've got all the specialists and working with the Raw Feed and Veterinary Society. We've got some heavyweights here that are going to come in uh, and there's just no response. So I find that particularly annoying. Not annoying. I find it... Um, and it's sad. Uh, it really, really angers me. I'm not going to let that go. Like it's, like the answer is just so obvious. It's not like a, a debate. It's like no, no. We have the studies. We know this is the same from humans, and uh, it's odious that that industry does not budge on those sort of things. And there's dogs suffering because of it. And pet owners yep. feeding and they're coming, the product. And the dog is two years old. You know. Yeah, so in. And they're and then on top of that, they're coming to me thinking that they're going to be able to put CBD in its mouth and fix everything. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. We yeah. are never, we've never been able to say CB is going to fix it without you fixing that gut and the immune yeah. system yeah. first. So yeah. Yeah. it just, and then you're, so I don't know if you know this. I have a Doberman who has osteosarcoma. Okay. Di she's on her, we're on 17 months from her diagnosis. I've done nothing conventional. I've only yeah. done ketogenic diet, um, a shitload of turkey tail mushroom, yeah. <laughs> medicinal yeah. mushrooms, and a yeah. shitload of full spectrum hemp extract. Yeah. And I do a uh, marijuana extract at night also. Ooh, okay, cool. 10 milligrams. Right. So people who tell me that THC kills a dog. Hmm. I was just, just going to ask, so how much TC, THC would the dog be getting and does it have a noticeable effect on him? Uh, yeah, so she gets, I give her 10 mil. I started with eight milligrams at night of uh, RSO or FICA, full extract of cannabis oil with a lot of THC in it um, from the medical dispensary here in Florida where I live. Okay. So I give her that at night. Um, so at first she peed the bed every night. And then I remember that CBD dampens the effects of THC. So I went ahead and gave her a 42 milligrams of full spectrum hemp extract with the THC and she doesn't pee anymore. Wow. So that was awesome. But uh, she hardly gets high now. No way. She, so she did get high initially. And initially she got super high, which, you know, that's why we're giving it to him at bedtime so she can just yeah. sleep it off. And in the morning, yeah. maybe a little bit of a, ris uh, you know, a little bit of her being going out and sitting in the Hang sun over. and have, <laughs> yeah. feeling really good. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so it's just like people saying that to us. You can't tell us anymore that raw is going to kill them. You can't tell me that THC is going to kill them. You can't tell them that, tell me that they're going to overdose on full spectrum hemp extract when I give her 80 yeah. milligrams of it. Well, yeah. 120 milligrams of it every single day. And anyway, on her at 15 months, I took her to get her checkup and we have no metastasis. Oh, so I have a team of vets just standing there. Of I course, gape. they're holistic, so they um, all already believe in raw feeding, but nobody gets to see what yeah. it really does. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're breaking records, and yeah. I haven't done a single conventional thing. She still has yeah. her leg. Yeah. The tumor's still growing, but yeah. what osteosarcoma does, as you know, is spreads and kills the dogs. Yeah, I was yeah. told she'd be, she'd be dead in four months. Yeah. Yeah, so amazing. these are the types of things that I'm going to take what you've done and I'm gonna, with the guide dogs and I'm going to do it here on my rescue and go, got rid of this, yeah. did that, yeah. extended life, got rid of this cancer, got rid of this cancer, yeah. got rid of this cancer. And every time I do it, listeners, I'm doing it with a raw, fresh diet yeah. and the help of real plant medicine or yeah. adaptogen, adaptogenic medicine. Yeah. Um, and to me, that's a changer. So when I have someone who has a dog with disease <laughs> And they're being told to, and of course they're, people understand that because our vets weren't taught about diet and nutrition, these big companies came in and said, this is what you, you don't have to worry about that. We have figured it out and based it on science. If your dog has pancreatitis, you feed them this science diet for pancreatitis yeah. Yeah. and it's yeah. non-food. Yeah, absolutely. Even the science behind those studies, they're called unfalsifiable comparisons. So when you want to, 
increase the amount of science that you have supporting your products you will produce a lot of these nonsense studies which you can get published because most of them own their own journals so they um they had the, an unfalsifiable comparison is let's take the skin product okay a, a product called dermal care they'll put some name on it what they do is they get their standard crap food and fed to 10 dogs and then they get their standard crap food fed to another 10 dogs but in the second group they put in a drop of cod liver oil or some form of fish oil to these dogs and uh, these dogs would have some form of atopic dermatitis so they're itchy dogs fed standard crap or itchy dogs fed standard crap with a drop of fish oil and they find that after a month the dogs fed the standard crap with a drop of fish oil itch less well now this is magic because now they can wrap this product up as a dermal care product they can slap a prescription on it even though the news agent can sell it down the road and it has no medicinal qualities whatsoever so it should be illegal hence they're in court now again for the second time about it it won't matter they'll bat that off uh, and so they wrapped this up as a science diet and your vet sees that this has been scientifically proven to reduce itch and it has been scientifically proven to reduce itch so therefore science says this is the product which is like me bringing out M&Ms with you know a bit of vitamin B complex in it and we kind of laugh about this vitamin donuts which did exist in the 50s oh, yeah. and we laugh we laugh at that but we have vitamin drinks now which are just soft drinks with a bit of vitamin in it mm -hmm. and we kind of this isn't good and we buy breakfast cereal that's been fortified with iron and B complex as if now it's good for your kids well it's, it's ever so slightly less bad for your kids but it's still a poison a start of the day so like we look at these products from the 50s and go yeah it's, like how did doctors ever recommend that vitamin donuts of course that's silly but we feed these breakfast cereals and now pet foods with this picture of a molecule in the front of it and the science behind it is disgusting and yet nobody we ever know looked better. at that science you know, we know better you know, it's yeah, but as we know consumers, better. we fall for it. Like, you know, as consumers fall for it. It's not, I don't blame the consumers. They, they, you fall for it. You're paying this person for their advice. And generally, the vets do have your pet's interest at heart. They believe what they're saying is correct. It comes back to a point you said just before the break there. And uh, you said, like, how do they not come to the realization that this is wrong? How do they b block the truth out? It's called cognitive dissonance. And there is a brilliant book for listeners to pick up. This guy is called Syed, S-Y-E-D. And he wrote a book called Bounce, which is just a phenomenal insight into sports psychology. But the, he does lots of studies of kids and stuff and talks about how top tennis players, golfers, Tiger Woods, where they all came from. He's the guy that coined the 10,000 hours makes you an expert. You know, they're not born, they're made. Really interesting guy. But his second book is Black Box Thinking. And that oh. compares uh, pilots and when they make a mistake to the medical sector when they make a mistake. And he explains why doctors via cognitive dissonance can't face their mistakes. It's, it, they're just parked. They're, they're shunned. They're, they're seen as idiotic if they make a mistake. It costs them their career. Whereas with pilots, when there's a mistake made, the whole industry sits down, analyzes it. You've got a black box. That information oh. is available to everyone. So in medicine, they don't learn from their mistakes. They make the same mistakes all the time. Drug side effects are not reported. Mistakes in hospitals are not reported. There are success Treating on symptoms fixing, instead. I was just going to say, yeah. So none of that is, is, is diagnosed properly, is teased apart. There isn't anybody held to account. And there's just this godlike complex going, well, I can't be wrong about this because I've got people's lives at risk. And so suddenly you get this ego coming into it. And suddenly it's just impossible for that doctor. So while vets, to conclude, while vets they're not they're not trying to harm your pet to selling this these junk products they honestly believe that the couple of token lectures given to them by you know ronald mcdonald in college were legit and that they, right. they they are backed by science they trust the reps and the science that these guys are spewing out and they paid and they someone it. a whole bunch of money to teach them that crap yeah yeah so that's, and so they, they, that they really think they're helping you but uh unfortunately uh customers are being grossly misled and used and that is the way of the world today with big yeah. pharma and uh, and crap food that's the two things they're a perfect marriage because they produce patients and patients are valuable so you'll never get a solution to the diabetes scourge that's laying out americans left right and center when actually it's a very simple cure to obesity and diabetes people could fix that with a stroke of a pen they could just jack up the price of sugar eliminate it from kids foods they could do things with the stroke of a pen but it'll never be done because diabetes is a highly profitable and obesity and heart disease that comes and from cancer, it cancer. Ooh, so yeah, much money absolutely so we make lots of money uh, fixing the symptoms when you get cancer dogs are 10 times more likely to get cancer than humans they can't even light their own cigarettes and yet they can't seem to fix it you know all the money into cancer research but cancer is still growing in the population isn't that strange they just can't seem to get that right and any products like CBD that show any potential in cancer they go behind the counter in Ireland anyway 
Um, Same we here. can't buy that stuff. Yeah, it's just. Oh, disgusting. we do well. Not uh, not anymore. Now we've uh, we fought, but we still have. Uh, you know, at, once you get it legalized and in the the right hands of you know being distributed to the right people, there's going to be the bad players who are make because it's uh, it's not regulated like the food and yeah. pet food industry is. Yeah, so people, yeah. the bad players yeah. are going to come out and put anything in that bag because they're just doing it for profit. Um, we do, we're taking questions from our listeners now. So we have a great question and this is a question that, um, along with it's too expensive, you know, to feed my dog, it's raw or fresh, or, um, I don't have the time It's too time consuming. This is another complaint I get. Um, so I love this question because I can't wait for you to answer it and us talk about it. So let's take that question. This is Odie, my baby old man, a.k.a. Barky Von Schnauzer. He's 11 years old and the love of my life. So Odie's favorite thing is to run up the stairs at night when we go to bed, and I noticed a couple years ago that he would stop midway up, and that's when I knew he was suffering from arthritis and joint pain. So the only treatments that I was being offered were harmful prescription drugs that cause liver damage and suppress the immune system, and I just wasn't willing to do that for my senior dog. And full-spectrum CBD oil was the only thing that worked. I would give it to him, and literally within 15 minutes, he was puppy-like again. I could see that he wasn't in pain, he wasn't panting, he was running up the stairs. So on Odie, I use Ease, which is a 550 milligram full-spectrum CBD oil with frankincense essential oil, turmeric and hemp oil, and it's great for arthritis, aches and pains, and allergies. No one likes to see their dog suffer. I know I didn't. And to be able to find an all natural product that doesn't cause additional harm and helps them is a lifesaver for me, and it brings me so much peace of mind. CBD Dog Health, healing naturally. Okay, before you talk, I'm gonna say, I want you guys to imagine yourself as a child or if you do have children, giving them Fruit Loops for breakfast every morning, and then taking those Fruit Loops away and making um, a healthy I don't know, scrambled eggs with some spinach and mushrooms in it. And I want you to tell me if your kid is going to be okay with that. And also realize that the shit they put on the dog food, they have to now make your dog want it and eat it again. So they literally are putting stuff on the food to make your dog, which I, I, you know, this will never be proven addicted to it. Can't no longer like the taste of real food. We've all been through this. We've all weaned yeah. ourselves off Coca-Cola or, you know, sweets and been like, Oh my God, I miss yeah, it I so much. I will kill somebody. I will kill somebody. I'm going to kill someone if I don't. Yeah. So yeah. I am guessing the same thing's going to happen with a dog. But the good thing about a dog is a dog is not going to starve itself. Right? So, yeah. I'm going to hand this over to you, and I want you to answer this question. Um, yeah, so like you, you're spot on there with the, with the start of that. There is taste enhancers in pet food. They're called MRPs, Maillard Reaction uh, Particles. And they, they're, they're actually pumped into supermarkets. They're in, all our, they're in a lot of our foods, and it increases your want for that food. So there's that. But there's also seven or eight different types of salt. Uh, at a minimum, 1% salt, the same salt content as, as uh, salted peanuts. Without the salt, the pets don't eat it. So cats particularly get crazy addicted to these compounds. And like you said, they're just bloody addictive. It's hard to get off that stuff. Uh, also, you get a shift in gut flora from eating high carbohydrate foods. So you'll get bacterial communities that are calling out for the food you've been feeding them. You've digestively conditioned your dog to this animal. So new studies of, of gut flora now show that you can actually take the gut flora from sugar addicted people, put them in someone else and they become sugar addicted. People wow. think I've got a, you've got, yeah, they think you've got the a opposite sweet of a fecal transplant. Yeah, absolutely. The nasty version. part of it. You can take out gut flora from obese people and put them into skinny people and make them fat as well. They've done that with rats and rabbits and all sorts. But um, it, now they're thinking that it's not that you've a sweet tooth. Oh, I must get some. It's the fact you've got gut flora saying, get sugar, get sugar, get sugar, get sugar. Next thing you know, you've bought some an ice cream and you're eating it. You go, oh, and you get that little chemical hit. Good boy. Uh, uh, you know, you've got your you've done right. And so the next time that voice comes, it's get sugar, get sugar, get sugar. Suddenly you're chasing a kid down the street to get the chocolate bar out of his hand and you feed it. So you're actually feeding a community that's calling for it. So you actually get pets crazy addicted to MRPs, the high salt content. And like you said, eating sugary crap every morning becomes very addictive. So here's some solutions. 
cats are another animal altogether. So everything I say just multiply right. by ten for cats. Remember, dog, cats will yeah. starve themselves. So it's we're not talking cats right now. We're just talking yeah. about a dog who's not eating the fresh yeah. raw food that she's putting yeah. in front of him. I, I would I would start off slowly. I would say every dog on the planet has had some form of beef or chicken at some stage because they're the favorite treats you give them and they're usually cooked and, you know, sometimes there is actually some chicken or beef in that treat. And some of us are now moving towards more natural treats, which are even more meat. So, and even they've had scraps off your plate at some stage. So beef and chicken, let's just target them. I would get some beef mince, okay? Um, and I would make a flat patty out of it, okay? So I'd just get the beef mince and flatten it like that. And then I'd pop it on the pan. Very bold, but who cares? You put it on the pan and you give it a light cook in each side because even vegetarians can barely say no to cooked beef mince it's just delicious and you cook it till it browns a little bit that browning is a maillard reaction particle that's the smell off a of barbecue those black lines that smell is the stuff they put in the pet food so okay. you you brown it each side and you even sprinkle it with some good quality salt very naughty but who cares you're only doing this as a little stop gap to get your dog onto raw in fact dogs on raw should be getting good quality salt in their diet because it's so nutritious not the refined crap that we get in most restaurants but the actual rocky stuff with a pink salt or Himalayan rock salt whatever you eat over there um, so that's very nutritious a little bit of that go is, is great so I would cook the burger a bit and I would sprinkle it with a bit of salt and then over time you cook it less and sprinkle less salt on it until eventually after seven or eight days you're giving her a virtually raw beef patty and sometimes you don't even just present a neat on a plate because um, we have a lot of studies now of dogs and rats and cats and humans that the first five months of life are really important. So if you feed a dog kibble in the first five months of life, he'll eat kibble for the rest of his life. If you feed him veg veg vegetarian food, he'll only eat vegetarian food. If you feed him meat and bone, he won't eat vegetables. So you have these YouTube cats of videos trying to eat a piece of broccoli. That's just ridiculous. Cats don't eat broccoli. But if you give it to them young, they will. So... You need to move the animal over slowly because this is a novel protein for him. He's never seen it before. He's already told you he doesn't like it. So there's a behavioral thing saying, I told you I don't like this. So I'd get a little bit of cooked salty burger meat and I'd mix it into his kibble. No animal on the planet can say no to that. Or chicken if chicken's his favorite or duck or fish or a tin of salmon, whatever. And I would slowly build a dose of cooked salted beef mince. I mean, dude, nobody can say no to that. And over time then, as the beef addition grows, it's like, I'm going to start cooking that less until you're eating slightly more raw and ease him onto it until he's calling for that meat. And then he's eating a meaty bone and other little implements. And then suddenly it's like, I'm ready to make a leap to raw dog food. Some dogs can, can be picky, but it's less common, you know. But, but the they, good thing about a dog slowly. is that it's going to eat eventually. So yeah. uh, raw, I don't make my own dog's food. I go to the, my few trusted brands because um, I have yeah. so many. But, you know, it is definitely, you know, when you're transitioning them, some immediately are like, what is this? Yeah. And eat it like crazy, yeah. which is what yeah. most do. But, of course, most I get the smaller little designer dogs who get pickier. I don't like it. I don't right. like it. And yeah. a lot of times, so then if if, we're, if they don't like raw, let's try a freeze dried or a dehydrated yeah. or something oh, yeah. else a little different or yeah. cook it a little bit. There's even yeah. lightly cooked versions now. Yeah. Um, so yep. usually it might be a texture type of thing. Yeah. Um, but they will eventually eat it. Or maybe they don't like chicken or beef. Yeah. They prefer beef. rabbit yeah, or exactly. turkey or something else yeah. or fish. Yeah. But yeah, I've never seen a dog refuse a sardine. So, yeah. you know, yeah, same, things like that or eggs. You know, things yeah. like that. These are real food that are real nutritional. So I love your advice yeah. and um, keep on it because if you yeah. get your dog to transition over to a raw, fresh diet, you're not going to be having the issues that you're probably suffering from. And you're not going to be making those trips to the vet that uh, the only thing that they're going to prescribe is going to make everything worse and not better. Yeah. And you're going to wreck your dog's gut. So this is the best thing you can do. And where can we get more information on your book and you and follow you? I know you have a wonderful website. I know we can get your dogs, Feeding Dogs by Dr. Connor Brady on Amazon. Yeah. Um, so where can we find more information for those of you who want to follow you? You did mention a podcast. I'd love to to. Tune yeah, in on that we're too. A, we're doing a few things. We have a new website coming on, on dogsfirst.ie. I'm going to keep it .ie. I was going to make it .com because 70% of my traffic now is from US. Uh -huh. But uh, we're just going to keep it .ie, .ie, which is our... Anyway, dogsfirst.ie. There's a new website coming to that in two weeks. And I'm putting up... But I used to make quite a good career of, out of traveling and doing seminars. So now I'm going to upload those seminars as webinars awesome. onto my website. Yeah, awesome. so that's, that's definitely a good idea. But uh, I do this podcast called Raw Pet Medics. 
with uh, Nick Thompson and Brendan Clark, two top vets over here in the UK. And the three of us get on on Tuesday nights at seven o'clock GMT. Uh, but the the all the uh, episodes are up there on Facebook for people to see. So we get on each week and we talk about a certain topic, you know. So we've been going a whole year now and uh, it's going strength to strength. So I love that. So Raw Pet Medics, my Facebook page is Dogs First Ireland. So if you enjoy hearing me rant about different topics now and again and a bit of funny stuff, I am very um, kind of like you, I think, Angela. I I will say what I what I feel, and uh, I sometimes it's uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I'm not going to try and speak in a. Um, uh, I'm not going to speak. I don't know. I, I'm just myself on Facebook. So you know what you uh, know. That, you yeah, don't need to prove yeah. yourself anymore. You bet. Yeah, a you... bit of fun. People take it too seriously sometimes. It's like Jesus. Would you just you know get get over yourself and be nasty to people? And so very little that is tolerated on the page but look look it should be a bit of fun so if you want to check me out on facebook it's dogs first on facebook but the website's going to be it's everything will be on that soon i'm going to move the podcast onto that soon and yeah awesome. so uh, yeah and absolutely. i have one other question welcome. uh you have a ah. cocker spaniel correct i do yeah i've inherited them my god i've never if had a I've... spaniel before oh, i know i can't god. believe you have a cocker spaniel i would have oh. never guessed that that's when no. that's no. when we see a cocker spaniel come into our groom shop we're like ah. Uh, she's, oh, she's who insane. Wants the she's insane. <laughs> and like, I'm a guide dog trainer, so it's like, you know, I, I get this dog and he, honest to God, only a mother could love him. And I said, I'll take him. Like, whatever's wrong, I'll take him. No problem. I'm a dog trainer. And I've had him about five or six years and I'm not messing once a week. My wife says, we've got to get a dog trainer. It's like, I am a dog trainer. <laughs> And it's bloody hell. I admire his spirit. And I try to explain to people that, like, you know, he just doesn't listen to me. He's like, he's just wound up all the time. He's on the go. And they said, but that's because that's you. You're like that. And I'm like, I am not like that. And I went around my whole life saying to people, when you see a stressy dog, it's a stressy owner. And uh, and then suddenly I've got this dog. And I said, but my dog's annoying. They're like, you're annoying. And it's, so that's a funny. lot of realizations. A lot of realizations. Same together. here. I, I love him. So if I, I were him, to give your, him. what's your Cocker Spaniel's name? Dudley. If I gave Dudley, Dudley the mm. microphone, what would he tell yeah. me about you? What would he uh, say? D- Dudley would instantly tell people that he enjoys the fact that I am absolutely no purist. And as my wife always says, if only they could see you now. So as much as I hate admitting this live on air, I am absolutely no purist. Like if I was eating some junk food, I was having a couple of crisps. We call them crisps. You call them uh, potato, potato chips. Potato chips. You know. I'm throwing one or two of them to the dog. Life is too short. His life is too short. He's right at my feet now. He rolled in poo this morning again. And you know what I mean? Just the fact he even rolls in poo. Um, so like I let him lick, when I'm finished eating a bit of ice cream, I would let him lick the ice cream stick. Absolutely. I let him do all, and I just don't give a damn. If people don't like it, well then off you go to some purist page. But like, you know, so he would definitely say that. So he is absolutely so, so attached to me because I generally feed him and do all that sort of stuff. But I think he would probably tell tales on me and uh, he would say, mm, look at you on Friday night with your few beers you know so he just has that attitude <laughs> little, little pair him, you know? of spectacles go mm, okay <laughs> yeah, i am picking up but uh good thing they don't so. have like thumbs so they can like record us and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely i do the same uh, thing too life is too short but i yeah. have confidence that me giving my dog a lick of the ice cream or uh mashed potatoes or something like that yeah. I'm yeah, confident lovely. because I know I'm feeding them an awesome diet and their gut exactly. is going to be fine. And I know exactly. I feed myself, right? Take care of myself. So when I have ice cream, I'm not going to wreck everything. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. thank you for sharing that. It has been no such problem. a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. I can't wait to meet you in person one day. Yeah, we will. Absolutely. Absolutely. As soon as I get myself in, over to the U.S. and do some form of a tour. I actually went to Florida on uh when was it a few years ago we did florida keys not florida keys we went to miami and we went to disneyland and all that kind of stuff awesome. adored florida god i loved the clear water that well kind of if stuff. you cool. well i'm right Next near there. there that's where susan yeah. thixon lives too so oh, she's in we could make a, an event out of it and i would oh, love yeah, to have I'd you out that. at the farm oh, i'd love that soon soon please thank I can't you wait connor to see that. thanks for having me angela you bet take care